This is Anthony Pascal. And this is Lori Elster. And this is the All Access Star Trek podcast. Today we're going to review Star Trek Picard, the penultimate episode of the season and the series called Vox. I can't even believe we're there already. And we've got a little bit of news. We're going to really just focus on Picard this week. So we're going to start with the IMAX screening that was announced and has caused a big kerfuffle. Everybody's up in arms um, about the fact they're screening the last two episodes together at selected IMAX theaters in 10 different cities across the United States. I think it was cool that they did this. This is another thing they should have announced on Star Trek Day, by the way. It was another, you know, Taylor Swift, not enough tickets, website shut down, you know, because it was so limited that, you know, but I think it's cool that they're doing this. There's going to be a Q&A. What's happening in L.A., there's actually two screenings in L.A. There's a four-year consideration screening at the Television Academy with cast and Terry and Alex. And that will include a Q&A. After that, there's going around the country, there's going to be a screening at 10 selected theaters where they're going to show the recording of the Just Happened panel as well. Right. So it's 10 cities. I think it's more than 10 theaters, but it's 10 cities. Right, right. Um, and the yeah, the site crashed, which I actually think is sends a really good message to Paramount Plus, frankly. But it was up and like I did get tickets, so I was able to get it like within about 45 minutes. And there's only one theater in New York showing it. And it's free, which is really cool. I understand why some fans are frustrated that it's not more widespread, but it's the only time in the modern era, have have we we haven't seen this for any of the shows? Discovery. Yeah, the only time I've seen them on the big screen like you is like at a premiere, which is a very different kind of event. Yeah, that's not the same thing. No, this is a really. I think it's a big deal, and I think it's great. Uh, by the time you're listening to this podcast, if you didn't know about this thing, it's way too late. Although you can get on wait lists, a lot of the the cities have wait lists. By Friday, you know those lists are going to be too long. I think. Yeah, probably. So. I was trying to be optimistic, but I guess it's kind of pointless at this point. <laughs> yeah. I guess we should just switch to our previously recorded interview with Mr. Jonathan Frakes. He's out promoting something called Purple Stride event on April 29th for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. So we're going to start off talking about that. Then we're going to talk about the card and some other cool stuff as well. Yeah, check it out. Let's start with uh, PanCan. So Purple Stride, Trek Against Pancreatic Cancer is the group. You have more people this year. Tell you know, Give us a... Oh, yeah. Here's the skinny. Saturday, April 29th is the Purple Stride. It's going to be in LA. It's also going to be in 59 other cities in the country. Our new member, our favorite Dr. Flox, John Billingsley, is joining Kitty Swink and Armin Sherman and myself in the uh, Trek against pancreatic cancer our goal this year our ambitious goal is to get 90 grand so right. every little bit helps what's happened over the last couple of years since i've been involved i've noticed the unspeakable survival rate of four percent was what happened when when my brother died and when uh, billingsley's mother died it is now 12 percent, which is <laughs> still unspeakable but three times as good a survival rate. And a lot of that, according to Kitty and Pam and Julie and Stephanie, is because of the success of this Pan Can and this Purple Stride, this fundraising, has increased awareness and encouraged doctors to take a closer look at some of the symptoms, which are, if you're over 50 and you happen to get diabetes real fast, if you have a strange back pain you didn't know you had. And most specifically, what we're encouraging is that when you go to your checkup, you tell the doctor that, by the way, my dad died of pancreatic cancer, or my brother died of pancreatic, or my uncle died. So the generational aspect of it is now being given much more credence. The objective of raising all this money, among other things, is to find an early marker, hopefully something that could be in that blood test that we all do when we get the blood sucked out of us a day or two before our checkup. So to that end, Please join us at Purple Stride on April 29th. Uh, go to the PanCan website and go to the Track Against Cancer. You don't have to give to me or to Billingsley or to Armin or to Kitty, but hit some of us with it. And uh, <laughs> we're, we're very competitive. 
<laughs> each of you has your own page, um, right? Which is all linked off the Trek Against Cancer page. And this is a walk, so people can. One of the ways people could do this. Is, are you all of you guys doing the walk? How long they're, is the walk? They're doing the walk from um, Santa Monica Pier. I'm actually at a convention in Calgary, so I'll be walking around the convention hall in good spirits. <laughs> but the uh, the walk is a mini marathon. I think it's two point five miles. And people all around the world can participate without actually walking in Absolutely. one of the 60 cities. You got it. Uh, by just donating to the Trek Against Cancer page at Pancamp. Anthony, you're so good. <laughs> but let's switch to, um, I don't know, what else can we talk about? How about that thing called Star Trek Picard? What do you think? Season three. What do you think? We've been loving it. We've been talking about it every week on the podcast and on the site. I think... Personally, I think it's the strongest season of modern Star Trek. Lori has a slightly different nuance to that. I just say modern live action Star Trek. Oh, because you're a Lower Decks fan. I'm a Prodigy fan in a huge way. Oh, really? That's great. The one show you have yet to touch, unless you have some news for us. No, I haven't, but I'm oh. waiting, waiting to be asked. A tech avail, as they say. <laughs> Um, that's all that's missing from it. I mean, you know, you know, it's just us kids here. What do you and your pals from the Next Gen crew think now that you're because I know a lot of them didn't even see it until now. You know, what what's the buzz amongst your group chat? LeVar said it best in one of the interviews when we were doing press for this season. We didn't dare hope that something this cool would happen, that we would all get to be back together again. And. I mean, I was lucky enough to be around as a director on Picard for the first three seasons, the first two seasons and the third season as well. But, so I was around Patrick and I was around the show and I was part of it because uh, Troy and Riker appeared. And so I got a taste of it and Brent got a taste of it because he's playing one of his thousands of song characters. <laughs> but for all of us to be asked back and such a clever story with uh, my wife and I watched it the other night and Jeannie said, each character has earned their return. And it's that's a credit to Terry. Terry Metalis has created a story that all these characters were needed to tell this story with this kind of depth and this kind of uh, nuance, and, and including Marina, who came in and now obviously is going to have to figure some shit out with Jack. And it's, it's, it's really well, really well done. I'm thrilled to be part of it. I'm very proud of, very proud of Terry. What, what we're seeing in the evolution of each of these characters, because it really is an evolution. And ev look, everybody's raving about your acting and we have been doing the same thing on our podcast because you're doing amazing work. And the character, I'm just wondering, the character has, has really, we're seeing layers of him we never saw before. So do you feel like it's a different acting level for you or that it's a, just a different understanding of the character for you and the challenge of that? That's a really, that's a good question. I think that a lot of it is informed by the 20 years it's been since Nemesis or whatever it's been. 20 years, probably, at least. When when we all got to play these characters. Worse, that's a lot of age to put on an actor and on a character. And whether it was conscious or not, in the first season, they created the storyline in which Riker and Troy had moved and quit Star Trek or strict uh, Starfleet, moved to Nepenthe with the hope that their son would be cured. He died. I don't know if they had the long game in mind, but it couldn't have been a better setup for including Riker in Picard's quest to save Beverly and then ultimately find out that, that they have a son. So this the, the, the weight of those scenes in which Riker tells uh, hard, dude. You, my son is dead. Yours is not. You just found it. Don't fuck this up. This is very important stuff. It, it's it, the, the scenes are so powerful and so relatable. I mean, you, you go into one of those scenes and you don't want to play the. I, I have a son. I have this wonderful son, Jameson, and you don't want to play the idea of your son dying. You don't want to ever mess around with that. And yet, that's the story you're telling. And that is a story that anybody with children, anybody who knows children, anybody who's been a parent, anybody, anybody 
that's why this I think is resonating is because we're telling stories that we that are um, emotionally accessible and I'm I think it's the age of the actors the age of the characters and the conflict that Terry has not been afraid to put into the show that Ron Muir had resisted for so many years Riker and Picard are in conflict um Troy and Riker are in conflict as I gather most marriages are after losing a child so I think there's a relatability and the other element that is I think working so well for us is is the levity the, the Riker Wharf taking the piss out of Wharf and Red Wharf <laughs> is now a pacifist and that stuff is great so this uh, just side note this is going to come out after episode nine both the Lori and I have seen episode nine. Oh, so you see the enterprise in nine. Oh yeah exactly oh, how about that moment i made a lot of very loud sounds while i was watching very excited happy yelly sounds <laughs> it was so i mean it was you can imagine how emotional it was but it was also i just i was talking to somebody earlier about it we walked around the set and we had our moment and all i, I, I took will over will wheaton was doing an episode from there and i sort of stuck him in uh during lunch so he because he was going to have to do one on camera where he was emoting about feeling it again. But the best, not the best, but one of the most next-gen aspects of that experience of being back on the Enterprise D was when we were all jammed in the elevator <laughs> and, and knocking each other off their marks and taking the piss out of each other and <laughs> accusing other people of farting. And it was, it was as if we had just gone back to that rambunctious, stupid childish behavior that we all had in 1987 it was great you know patrick stewart has talked about concerns about this just being a reunion and there kind of are aspects of a reunion obviously here you know as you guys were i know you were an early adopter on team terry because you know he talked you into this in, during season yeah, two right but you had to get everyone else on board so you know were you involved in convincing everyone including patrick to eventually sign on and you know who was the last you know were there anyone who needed a little like you should do this there were no resistors i mean it was a dream come true patrick because he had made it so clear that he didn't want picard to be a next generation show uh terry took patrick and me to lunch and explained this story about Beverly having been a Doctors Without Borders and needing to be rescued. And then Picard calls his old buddy Riker, who's in not having a great time in his marriage. And I think in that lunch, Patrick realized there was a good story to tell. And, it, and the word reunion is what I think was sticking in his craw. And I think what Terry's, I don't think, I know what he's done is each character has earned its place. So we started with Beverly and Riker, and then we bring Worf in, and then that great episode where we see um, LeVar comes on, he's pissed off. Data's filled with lore and before and so on. So all these characters are now involved in solving and we get the, one of the great villains. I mean, Amanda Plummer is a spectacular villain. So everybody's got a story and Jack Crusher is at the heart of it. So now in comes Troy and who better than this wonderful Betazoid empath counselor try to to work out jack's issues so it is it's a reunion just by definition but it is not certainly let's get the gang together and sing the old songs it's it's a new story well and everybody's changed so much too oh my and god now, yeah <laughs> you're being gentle everybody's <laughs> old well it's not that everybody's grown and uh, all the things that have changed who they are is so believable and it makes it much richer yeah and then now we're also in addition to getting all of you guys back we're also seeing the return of some characters oh. you know guest star characters what about and, Ro? What is well that? some that you had very specific connections with which Ro and shelby both come to mind yeah and in in picard they're mostly played against picard but you had you know you had a rivalry with shelby you had a fling with Ro. yeah so, do you wish you'd had a chance to sort of have a moment with them in Picard that I went did. Back to I, I I wish that to, to the character. I mean, we did it. There was a look that was, I think, 
not quite clear, but it became very much the row and Picard. I wish she'd been there for a couple of episodes, to be frank. Same. Shelby was a great idea. And Elizabeth and I did uh, Ready Room for that, for episode nine, which you'll see. And it was such a treat to have her back. She, she did, I didn't know that that was one of her first jobs was coming on and playing that pivotal character on our show. I had no idea until I just, I thought that she was a, a seasoned vet because she was so strong and so great in that part. But she said she was nervous and it was, a, it was very revealing. So much we don't know about our other fellow thespians. <laughs> Did you think it was funny that Riker's still mad at her after all these years? I thought it was great. <laughs> He was, he was really knows how to hold a grudge. <laughs> you know, when we talked on the red carpet, you know, you were all for, and even in our last interview, you're all for the spinoff show. I know that, but. Oh yeah. So again, secrets from the, you know, TNG group chat. What are people saying behind the scenes with your friends and with Terry and, you know, with the gang, are they more excited now? Do you think it's going to happen? I I'm, well, I'm an eternal optimist, as you probably know from all these times we've chatted. But I, I think given what's going on in social and trending, it seems to me that there's got to be, somebody's got to address it, don't they? Somebody's got to admit that this is, um, this ground is fertile, is it not? I mean, and also, you see, we, by the end of the show, it's set up. The legacy characters that through the forges, I mean, Worf's got a kid, Riker and Troy have a daughter who's brilliant, and the Jack Crusher is a uh, you know, it's a brilliant character, and he's on the bridge now. I mean, Jerry Ryan's there as the captain. There's everybody loves Shaw. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of the pieces of the puzzle for a legacy show, in my opinion, my humble opinion. <laughs> Um, we're running out of time, so I've got some speed round for you. Oh yeah. Are are you expected to be involved with Strange New World season three and or the Academy show as a director? I am booked to direct an episode of season three of Strange New Worlds, and I'm hoping if I don't screw up to get on the uh rotation on on the Academy show. We've also been hearing this. We see little snippets about the Brent and Johnny show. Is that a joke? Oh, or is yeah, that a no, real no. thing? That's a real thing. That's a wish fulfillment reality show that actually we met on yesterday. We're going to do a little sizzle reel this weekend. Two guys, one guy named um, Dan Bishop and, and, and Martin Lenkow, who's from Cameo, are already doing a couple of these. There's one with the twins from um, Harry Potter, and there's one with a couple of the Hobbits. The Harry Potter is a travel show. And the Hobbits is kind of a beer and food show. And the Brent and Johnny show is a wish fulfillment reality show where we come to somebody's town to help their kid through his musical. Or we come to a town and help them put together the Star Trek wing of their library. Or we come to, and, and it's a kind of a road show in that Brent and I, who are kind of two old curmudgeons, it's sort of like American Pickers. And it's sort of like uh, Dirty Jobs. And it's sort of like uh, Queer Eye in that it would be us going around and trying to figure out how to create the surprise and wish fulfillment. And then at the end of the episode, we deliver it and everybody lives happily ever after. And Brent and Johnny have come and, and done something Star Trekian and in, in that they've fulfilled someone's wish. So it is a uh, it's real. And we're very excited about it. Where would one see something like this? Is this YouTube? That's, or... the, um, that's interesting. That's exactly what Terry said. Is it YouTube? I think the back, the back behind the scenes stuff will probably have a YouTube channel. But the hope is that I think the other guys. I, mean, I know that the um, the travel show that the twins are doing has just been picked up by HBO Max. It feels to me like a Discovery kind of a show or a National Geographic. It feels like something in that HG. You know. Right, your dial in one of those worlds. It feels like that kind of place. Excellent. If you have Love more time, anything you could tell us about the season finale and how it accomplishes Terry's dream of a proper send off for both Riker and the TNG crew. Well, it's um, 
boy, I get in such trouble for this shit. Nobody <laughs> dies. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to set me up, Anthony. I've just gotten back into good books with these people. <laughs> I know. I'm a stinker. You um, are. You should plug the um, crossover from season two of Strange New Worlds, which is coming. Okay, give us some action on that then. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got to go and do the ready room with... Uh, Tony Newsom and Jack Quaid. This is two characters from Lower Decks, Mariner and Boimler, just happen to cross over from their animated world into the ship with Anson and Rebecca and Ethan on Strange New Worlds. And it is a flat-out comic. It's it's fabulous. It's a fish out of water. It's they're, they're, You know, fortunately, both Quaid and, and um, Tony look like their characters. So... <laughs> It's it's so absurd to see them in three dimensions and their interrelations with the uh, Boimler is obsessed with Spock. And <laughs> so it's just it's just great. I'm terrified of number one of Rebecca. It's there's so much good, so much good stuff. And then Mariner comes to save the day. It's it's um it's very, very funny. I'm very proud of it, and I can't wait for people to see it. Are they in the whole episode? Are they in it from oh, the yeah. beginning? Yep, it, it opens with uh, it opens as a cartoon and it becomes the the real show. Excellent. Well, Can't we've wait. we've we passed our time limit, um, but it's always a pleasure, Jonathan. Mine, all mine. Thank you guys very much. Thank, oh, you. thank you. Peace out. You know what's funny? I I love that we both got to talk to him at the same time. That was great. But he did totally dodge the question after calling it a good question um, <laughs> about his own acting. Like he's been doing an incredible acting job and he just kind of gave credit to the show and the development of all the characters and sort of slipped away from the uh, compliments he's been getting all over the place about what a great job he's doing this season. Well, he did say he's getting older and with age comes wisdom and all that stuff. But yeah, sure. you know, he, he's he's very self-deprecating, but um, I think he knows that he's doing a good job. And, you know, the fact that he is so enthusiastic and everyone else is so enthusiastic to do more of this was self-evident. Oh, yeah. Hopefully that happens. And, and we I, get the Brent and Johnny show, too. <laughs> I was going to say, I hope we also get the Brent and Johnny show, because that would be so much fun. I love that idea. When I heard Spiner talk about it, I just assumed, like everything, it was a joke. But it sounds like it's totally serious. They're working yeah. on it and everything. So Yeah. Yeah, he said they were going into a meeting about it. So there you yeah. go. Let's start talking about Vox. Yeah. Whew, that was a big episode. People are going to, I mean, this is one of the, if, you know, over the last week, everyone who worked on the show is like, don't pay attention to spoilers, try to avoid the internet basically for a week. Cause it, yeah, there was some big stuff, big, 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 big things happening in this episode, really good things happening in this episode. I enjoyed it very much. It's still suffers from the part one situation of a two part thing a bit. And if I have a gripe, it is that things felt rushed and it's weird after the two episodes where I felt like they were dragging things out at times, especially episode seven, it, you know, they had the, the cliffhanger about Jack t two times in a row, which was nuts. And <laughs> this time they just started just flying. I mean, the amount of time it took from opening to Jack leaving the ship, like there was like hardly any time at all, you know, yeah. it's like, you're Borg. I'm leaving. Goodbye. Oh, my God. You know, and then there was these series of exposition scenes where they were just I mean, they were jumping to conclusions so fast. I mean, in a way, it's very next gen, right, where you'd see that where people would say, oh, well, if X, then Z, you know, because you don't have time sometimes. But it was even faster than that. And on a such a serialized show where they have the time. So I, I think the, the Borg reveal and the Deanna thing, all of that should have been in episode eight. Some of the stuff at eight should have been in seven and seven should have, you know, been a little zippier. Yeah, uh, I definitely think elements of the story, some of them needed to, we needed time to breathe in some of them and just get what the hell they were talking about and put the pieces together and give characters moments that they kind of should have had. Not that they didn't have some wonderful ones like they're, 
There's so much in this episode that's great, but had they plucked some of the stuff out and had it in earlier, there would have been more time, which I think we're just basically agreeing on that. So, I mean, it still felt like a, a present to Star Trek fans in such a big way. I mean, I, I keep saying, I'm like fan service, schman service, serve it up, baby. Like, I really loved all of that stuff. But there were moments, there were things I didn't get until I'd watched it twice that I was like, oh, that's what's, oh, okay. And then there were scenes that I felt were just not there that I really wanted to see. One of the big things, we haven't talked about how the episode ends, and we're going to get into that, but <laughs> one of the other big things in this episode, besides Frontier Day itself, was they killed Shaw. Shaw. Which, and, you know, we joked, you know, in episode one, oh, you know, before even before episode one, we're like, oh, he's dead Captain Walking, and this guy's never, he's not going to make it through the whole season. And now, more recently, we were like, oh, no, it looks like Shaw's going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I knew as, as soon as that scene started rolling, I was like, oh, no, oh, no, because I kind of felt like he's not going to escape with it. Like, it just, I could feel it coming, especially when he was telling them when he's going like, Riker, go, whatever, go. And I was like, oh, that's, that's His it. order for people to leave was weird, right? Worf, I think, went early on. and Worf went you know. way too early. Worf, <laughs> yeah. I thought Worf would be sticking around to make sure that everybody else got there. Yeah. But he went, he left Rafi, he left, <laughs> he left Picard and Riker, off he went. <laughs> but usually when you're going to kill a character, you give him a little, you give him more to do in that episode. And he really didn't have a lot. He, he kind of figured things out in the turbo lift with the maintenance channel. That was the whole point of the USX excelsior moment when the excelsior right. exploded and they're like how did we even hear them maintenance oh maintenance let's go to repair those ship those shuttles aren't connected to the network so he kind of figured out how to get off the ship but that's almost like did you even notice that or not you know that he's the one who kind of saved them and the seven arc was i mean her arc isn't complete but the seven arc with him was complete which is kind of became her should i be in starfleet arc he became a proxy for her for the prejudice against the borg you know and so when he finally called her seven of nine that was her finally you know saying i you know accepting that and that's you know her getting through that i guess yeah i i mean i would agree with that i just i kept thinking like he he does look very thoroughly dead because I was trying to come up with ways that they would drag him off and use some kind of technology and he'd be fine. But he looked like super dead. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, that's, you know, that's the problem in Star Trek. People are like, is 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 Vatic really dead? But it's like, you know, she blew up into pieces and and then they blew up her ship, you know, which probably vaporized the pieces. But sure, you can always maybe they do come back in the finale. She could Terminator you know? to it and all the pieces could yeah. just pull back so together. Maybe he, you know, same thing. But emotionally, they're done. They were done with Vatic. Really, she didn't need eight episodes. She was kind of her whole point was done by episode seven, I think. So, you know, emotionally, he's fulfilled his mission to kind of anoint seven as captain of the titan yeah i mean you gotta feel bad for the guy too because like he did not invite any of this his yeah. worst nightmare came true i mean the thing is it was all gonna happen anyway so you have to yeah. remind yourself like all these plans for frontier day they were all in motion so but yeah. he, you know he was gonna lose his crew in that way but really it just turned out so terrible for him in every possible way before accepting seven, he it would have been funny if he said something like, I should have never let those guys on the ship or something. Right. I should have known. <laughs> Bunk beds for everybody. Yeah. But he, you know, he, it was a good death. But it's another thing that I just felt was rushed a bit. But let's zoom back. Let's talk about, you know, what we learned about Jack and, and all of that stuff. What do you think? Yeah, I think we should. I mean, the, the whole... Uh, this is the the most rushed part to me. Like Tr Troy says, "Don't worry, Jack. Whatever happens, you won't be alone." And then the minute she opens the door, he is alone. So she goes running off to tell them, and 
like you said, within just seconds, he's pretty much off the ship. But I thought their whole way of handling it was so wrong. And I understood all of Jean-Luc's incorrect decisions because you could see where they came from. He had guilt over his own participation in the in the destruction when he was Locutus. He had guilt for passing it on to Jack. He had, he felt so responsible, but the answer was not for him to go talk to Jack by himself. And the proof is how things went. Yeah, that, that was a bad conversation, obviously. It was, and I think I would have felt... I understand again. It's that same thing. I understood why they wanted to get to that place, but there, I, I, it made no sense to me that Beverly wouldn't say, "Are you kidding me? We need to go talk to him together, and we need to reassure him because that's what she would say." Protocols or no? It was good that Deanna said he's dangerous. Yeah, right? I thought that was great. Yeah, I mean, realistically, they should have like just gassed the room immediately because he's already shown an ability to take over other people so it's like why was it a surprise that that's the that was his go-to move he's already done it before but they made him an enemy immediately like any chance of saying we're gonna let's talk about this let's protect you let's figure out what we can do they didn't do any of those things no like you're going to the vulcan loony bin and that's that yeah yeah it was (laughs) very poorly handled you know by the way great acting by Stewart and Spaliers. Oh my God, Patrick Stewart, especially when he's talking about how the things he was forced to do, I thought that was so powerful. And I do think, in terms of long term things that would affect him, this is the biggest thing that ever happened in his whole life, for sure. And the way Jack talked about his motivations in life and combining that with the visions of seeing the connections, and he's always had this yearning for connection which is kind of a a light almost a lighter side of the borg but it's been in him you know it's now clear how it's always been in him you know i i mean obviously we've been saying it's the borg for a long time i'm curious how many people are going to be shocked it's the borg i know there were other popular theories but you know they've done a really good job i feel of when you look at it and you go yeah that all it all adds up you might go oh god the borg again they've done the borg every season and the Borg, you know, it's kind of like, again, with the Klingons, right? But this time it's again with the Borg. But it makes sense that the ultimate bad guys and they made it personal. I liked how there was even, you know, subtle things about how they explained how Picard heard the Borg in first contact, which yeah. was never explained before. I mean, I do think it's funny. I Like months ago when we were chatting on Slack about all this it must maybe the first episode i don't know second episode but you are speculating that picard had passed some kind of borg thing on and i was like like by doing it with bev i don't think you can pass it on through sex like i just thought that doesn't make any sense and then as the season went on i was like i think that's what happened (laughs) but they were laying you know the the you know the enterprise d was telegraphed in the first episode if you rewatch episode one it's all there you yeah know? yeah um changelings but nicely done. Borg, yeah enterprise d uh, frontier day yeah you know they they which is let's face it for 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 this show i mean we haven't seen the finale but they've done a good job of bookending and and laying the groundwork <laughs> yeah that didn't happen in the other seasons no so you know, they, they, that's really good. Now, we've talked about this before, about they knew where they wanted to go with this episode. But since they decided to do so much in this, in the two part finale, they had to get Jack off the ship. It was there was that moment where Jack leaves the ship and Picard and Beverly are just looking out the window going, oh, there he goes. You know, and they seem so calm and serene. I thought, oh, this was all. This is, you know, the the Star Wars trick of, you know, you put the tracking device on the ship and you let them go, right? right. It's the oldest trick in the book because it was so easy for Jack to get off the ship. Think about he had to steal the shuttle. He had to get, you know, permission to leave. They couldn't tractor beam him or phaser him or torpedo him. He just left. They didn't even try. I exactly. mean, actually, the funny thing is I really liked that shot of the two of them looking out the window. Like, I liked that moment between them watching it but i was like they they didn't even 
tell anybody. Like <laughs> they didn't do anything. And we do, we need because we're Star Trek fans, we need to see that moment of we can't do it because of blabbity blah techno babble reason. Right. You know, That's why you know to transport yeah. them. I mean, so we've seen on the like Seven had to arrange for no one to be guarding the shuttle bay. Now it's a skeleton crew, sure, but on the bridge they would have been notified. You know, I guess he maybe he grew his little collective of ensigns. Right. And so he, you know, whatever it is, but this is one of the things, you know, there's a there's a couple things like it was unclear why the Borg Queen really needed him, but it's because he's the transmitter and they showed him being plugged in when they had their scene together. And then later they showed showed the Borg cube transmitting, but that what they should have shown, they should have cut back in to show how Jack was part of that transmission. That his plugging being plugged in twenty minutes earlier, or ten minutes earlier, you know, was the last piece of this puzzle to make this work. After I watched it the first time, I was trying to. I was like, wait, why do they need Jack? They have everything. I totally didn't make that association. Then I watched it again and I think we talked about it in Slack or something. And I was like, Oh, right. But yes, they just needed one more cutaway yeah. at that moment to connect those things because I didn't connect them. Yeah. I was like, well, they have this Borg thing is sending out a signal and everybody's receiving it because of this thing that's been in the transporter that's affected all the, you know, the young ones. So they, what's, what's Jack's role? There's no role for him there. It didn't they feel. Kind of, you know, in one of the multiple Jordy data, Beverly exposition scenes, they sort of explained it about how the genetic the code and, and the, yeah, it was, <laughs> you know, the but birds, they, the bees. <laughs> yes. It's the worst birds and the bees conversation ever. <laughs> But so, so let's keep talking about Jack for a minute, because I feel like he planted the seeds of how this whole thing is going to resolve. So is that a fair thing to talk about or should we not talk about it? Well, now we're speculating. But yeah, I mean, Jack went to the queen. I mean, it, what was his plan? Right. He's like, I'm going to tell her I'm going to show that lady, that Borg lady what's up. You yeah, I didn't, <laughs> his whole so anyone else would have said to him, "Wait, why are you going there? And what is your plan?" That's exactly what she's wanted all along. That's what this all these people died to stop you from having to go. You know, back before when the strike had them and all this stuff, and now you're just going, which you should have done, I guess, immediately. Well, he, he but, I mean, he he thought because he's an idiot. He's like, well, I'll just trade my life for everyone else. Like he didn't, he thought the Borg Queen just wanted him to come home so that they could have like tea together or something. Like he didn't see his role in the plan. Because yeah, I don't he think wasn't he was there. Thinking, he wasn't the, thinking of his role in the plan, but he was thinking of, I'm going to find out what the hell is. Like, I feel like it was just, he was determined to find out what is all this. And that was the only place to have an answer. But his big speech to Troy before that, where he talked about how he was always so bothered by suffering and violence and poverty and bigotry. And that he, and you know, he's talking about Borg stuff. He's saying, I always thought if people could only see each other and hear each other, they'd all, and he makes it like a joke about cybernetic authoritarianism, but he's been talking about his own humanitarian soul. And there are a couple of mentions to Beverly and how she raised him, like Picard brings that up as well. So I think that's what's going to save us all, is Jack is going to somehow snap into Jack and the guy who always cared about other people who were downtrodden. He said he was there to give her mercy, but I think, you know, he was pointing a phaser, but I think he that's actually true. He's going to bring mercy. Yes. And caring his kind of loving doctoring nurturing nature the big question is and this is where i'm hoping they're going in the finale is they don't need to just beat this borg threat they need to end the borg period you know which was done in like one of the david mack book series is they did this kind of big crossover thing and they ended the Borg. The Borg were, they kind of transcended to a new plane of existence and it's complicated, but I feel like 
and let's just forget that the boar got mentioned on discovery for a second in the 32nd century. <laughs> um, but I, I would like to see the show end where it's, o- it's over, but they're not all killed. They're like, maybe the Borg get turned, you know, and become yes. nice. But then again, that is essentially the end of season two, at least for one little pocket of the Borg. Right. You know, just like if they just if if this thing end because first contact was great. But if this is another thing where they just kill another Borg queen and, you know, we're just going to wait around till the next one pops up. <laughs> Star Trek Picard season four, the season you never saw coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, you know what? Let's have this conversation after episode 10. But that's yeah, I, agreed, I'm hope, that's where I'm hoping. I think you're right. And I, I'm kind of hoping it is bigger than just beating her. Let's talk a bit about Frontier Day itself. And Shelby. Yes. Were you shocked, surprised? What did you know? I did think you recognize I, her right away? Yeah. And well, yeah, I know her voice and her and I feel like I just knew that she was coming. Like we'd known people have been talking about her as one of the possibilities. Yeah. You know, so. Um, and it made sense. I love that, you know, as we said to Jonathan Frakes, that he's still mad at her, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was really good. But there was something she and she seemed to get shot at the end, which was somewhat disturbing. Yeah, I think she let's just call her dead. I think she served her oh, purpose, no. too. She can't be dead because Roe died and then she everybody comes back just to get killed. And so that is very, you know, emblematic of this series. She got shot in the gut with two phasers. I think it's over for her because the Borgified kids were saying eliminate all non, you know, so it's, you know, it was full on Logan's run. You're either assimilated or dead right. from their point of view. Right. No taking prisoners. And they can't, I guess they they can't using their new, I, I, I did like how they kind of worked out the Borg have changed how they assimilate, which I've always said, you know, the Borg are all about perfection and change. So I think it's cool that they've come up with a whole new way to do it. I guess because of whatever Janeway did mess them up so bad, they needed a new way to assimilate. Right. Um, we didn't really get a good look at the queen. You know, she's voiced by Alice, Alice Krieg, but it isn't her playing the queen. It's some other actress. And you could tell she's kind of asymmetrical and, you know, we haven't got a good look at her, but I don't think she's, Kind of sexy Borgy like first contacty. Yeah, I, she didn't seem sexy Borg. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So one of the things with Shelby, I was actually happy to see her, um, and she did finally get an Enterprise, which is funny. Um, the crazy part, like she was talking about this fleet and about unity and defense, right? And then she said, in case of the unthinkable, fleet wide in- incapacitation, the system would pro- this system would protect the crews. And I immediately thought, no, how would it, wasn't that the opposite? Wouldn't that mean everybody's screwed? Like, I understand why the changelings and the Borg did all that, but I, how could someone like Shelby, who at that, who's not a changeling <laughs> at this point, think that that's a good idea? The question is, because it sounds like such an obvious thing that the changelings and the Borg would think of, like, what if we could get all of their ships connected? Yes. That's a good idea, you know. So hopefully it was an evil plan, but to have non-evil people like Shelby, Admiral Shelby, and Janeway, who's somewhere out there. Well, maybe uh, I think Janeway's just kidnapped somewhere. That's my theory. <laughs> Um, and real Tuvok, everyone else went along with the stupid plan. So yeah, it makes no sense. And I'm not even going to try to justify it. She articulates it and it doesn't make any sense when she says it. And then Picard is like the irony of her endorsing something so Borg like. And I was like, right. But even tactically, she was always really smart. It just doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense. Especially after the living construct. Of course, these are two separate shows and all that, but they, they should have learned their Prodigy. lesson. Yeah. yeah I was yeah. like, there were a couple of times that I was like, they should have watched Prodigy because then they would know. So they now have all of Starfleet, but trillions of people live in the Federation. So the threat now, I, I guess, is because they they only have assimilated people who've used transporters in the last month. Right. And are under the age of 25. Yeah. So whoever, whenever they stole Picard's body and they started monkeying with the transporters so 
they have all the youngsters. So does that mean like everyone over 25 in Starfleet that isn't at the fleet museum is dead now? Is well, that's kind is of dead a, or being, you know, they said kill the, those who aren't assimilated. Well, I didn't mean every, I just mean everybody on all those ships. Yeah. That's what I mean. So you know, either and, they're, and, they're dead or they're hiding or they've somehow found, you know, escape somehow. But I think a lot of people are dead. Yeah. Like, yeah. A lot. A lot. A lot. So what's next? So the Borg are going to start, they've got the fleet. Are they just, they're just going to start assimilating earth and everyone on under 25 is going to get assimilated, I guess. And everyone else is going to get killed. I mean, are they going to force them into the transporter? It's the only way to do it, but you don't really need to force. You just start beaming people. You just do site to site, trans, you know, or right. maybe or whatever, you know, so they'll just start beaming people from, you know, San Francisco to New York and then they get borgified. Now I'm just remembering Roe sending all those people to the transporter to beam over to the. <laughs> well, that was another clue because Jack, remember, yeah. he saw how they were being. That was a very subtle but smart clue that the yeah. transporter was bad news. And that the transporter officer was the changeling. Yeah, no, the, 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 the very good. well woven in. That yeah. was all very smart. I feel like when I watch this whole show again, it's all going to make even more sense. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. In a really good way. Like it'll be when a show is really smartly plotted out, it's a joy to watch it again when you know everything. Yeah. Because you're kind of catching up on all those things. Yeah. You know, we kind of jumped ahead. Of, so, so the Titans taken over, the fleet's compromised, people are dead. So they have to leave the ship because it's all okay, boomer. With the kids on the ship. I know. <laughs> and uh, I did like, you know, the, the, the Deanna saying I was, I, there was some good humor in this episode. Uh, the Deanna saying I wasn't, you know, never so happy to see so many wrinkles. Yeah, that's in my best lines category for sure. The humor started ramping up more and more as we got later into the episode. It got ironically lighter after the Borg assimilated Starfleet. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, ah, you know, I mean, there was a, the, the, I like how data now, like data is funnier, I guess, but he still doesn't exactly have the hang of it, you know? No, He's, but I, I very much liked his scene with Picard with yes. the hand on the shoulder. I thought that there were two big, so there was the data saying, you know, I hope we all die quickly thinking that was lighter and funnier. So that's one thing. But his two emotion scenes with Picard with the where he just realizes just a hand on his shoulder and then Picard reaches up and takes his hand. And I just thought that was lovely. And I thought when Jordy freaks out about his daughters, day old data, original data couldn't have been reassuring to him. And this yeah. data was in just the right, like the logic of knowing you got, you know, we have to make a plan, but also you felt like he understood the feeling behind it. So nice. Those were both really nice moments. He is data, but something new and it's yeah. working. An old new character, just like they said. Yeah. And the oh, there was another great funny line, by the way, when Worf is talking about how he preferred the weapons. We have to get to all this, but how he preferred the weapons on the E and Troy goes, Worf. And he goes, oh, it's one. It's lovely. It's beautiful. Whatever. He says. Someone had to speak up for the E. I did. I did feel it was a bit flippant. So, so when they, you know, so they reveal the D and then Jordy says, because of course we can't use the E and they use it as a joke to imply because the F is there. So we know something happened to the E, but we still don't know what. Yeah. Worf just goes, it wasn't my fault. So implying that it was his fault. Right. And it was destroyed or something, yep. whatever yep. it was, it wasn't good, you know? I they thought that was funny. It. That didn't bother me at all. But let's so let's back up a little bit because we're already on the bridge. So let's back up or whatever. Let's go back to Jordy. You know, we knew something like this was coming when Jordy's like, I have a better idea. And they get in the shuttle and they go. And then I mean, it was the my favorite ship moment since the motion picture. Seeing that ship. Even though it's like, oh, for sure, that's got to be what's there. That's what they're going to do. We know it's coming. It was my heart swelled. It was just a wonderful, beautiful moment. I loved Picard's face. Looking, I kept thinking, I was thinking of Picard looking at the painting 
in the first episode and them saying like nobody likes the fat one and now and look here's the fat one and it's beautiful yeah it was it was a wonderful moment you know because we knew they were going to go back to the museum but obviously they had plenty to choose from i know so many great ships there and you know the voyager would have been great the I, enterprise a obviously i still like your idea of each person gets one I think that's everybody, still everybody such a gets good a idea. ship i feel like if terry had, had the money that's what he would have done <laughs> but they did again they dropped they they, they there was a, like just a tiny mention of hangar 12 yeah so they laid the seed and as soon as yeah you kind of knew it was coming but it was great it was beautiful and stepping onto the bridge and the lights came up i was like oh lights remember lights um i was very yeah. excited about the brightness it, it would have been fun if everyone like 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 acted like vampires when the lights <laughs> went on <laughs> like <laughs> i must say though because it was there was a great scene data feeling emotional when he says i feel and we and I think Deanna or we know or we understand. No, no. What Deanna says is she says everybody does because yeah. she can feel everybody's feelings. So it was like the yeah. most perfect answer because even if she couldn't, she could have said that, but she knew it. So she was saying it with certainty that they were all feeling the same thing. And didn't he say hello chair or something like that to his chair? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like the scene in the conference room in the previous episode where they took a beat. They took a moment. Yeah. It wasn't rushed. And again, this is like they rushed things earlier so that they could spend a couple extra minutes. But my solution to that was move stuff out of this episode into another episode, not to agree. Um, but the, cause I did, I don't want them to rush any of this stuff in act three. Act three is perfect. Except yeah. for the joke about the carpet. Yeah. I, if, if they wanted to make that joke, which is fine, I get why they wanted to make it. Um, it should have been like quieter and smaller and maybe somebody else delivering it. I don't know. Yeah, Patrick didn't deliver it great. And he, there was too I much of a setup. I don't think he got joke, to be honest. I don't think yeah. he knows that fans are talking about carpets and no carpets and that everybody, that's, <laughs> there's just, there's a lot of viewer history in there. So that could have been more, uh, just quicker. Frakes would have been better at it, but otherwise it was all pitch perfect. It's not enti entirely clear what the hell one ship could do. And there's, you know, not a lot of people there. They're, they're at the crew. That's it. It's just them. <laughs> yeah. We have to assume that there's robots and, you know, Jordy mentioned something about drones loading photon torpedoes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe the ship has all, you know, these little flying drones, you know, doing which we'll never see, you know. Yeah, um, we don't need they, to. I don't. They need built to see the that. bridge, and I don't think they built anything else. That's fine. The bridge is a is a thing of beauty and wonder, and I'm so happy to see it. And how delightful was it to hear Majel Barrett's voice? Oh, that was great. That was great. That I didn't see coming, and that just filled my heart. That's where I just go. Well, I, I'll forgive so many things. There, there was no other way to do it, so I didn't see it coming. But then, what else would they do? Right. right. As soon as you hear it, you go, of course. <laughs> but I didn't expect it. And it's a beautiful surprise. I mean, what's amazing is that bridge is better. When when the thing lit up for the first time, it's never looked better. Yeah, it looked, yeah, looked beautiful. So I'm sure people are going to be comparing, like, did they get the pro pro proportions exactly right? Because <laughs> it, it, it kind of did look a little smaller, but I'm sure it's not. It just kind of feels smaller just because of the size of the Titan Bridge is just well, enormous. Well, Riker did ask. In a way, you know, all is forgiven because the Enterprise D was great. And yes, it's nostalgic and all that stuff, but it all makes sense that they need a ship like this to do whatever they're going to do in the actual finale. And it reminds them of who they are, which Riker said out loud. But, it, you know. That is who they are. And it reminds us, it reminds them, these are our heroes. They're going to come save the day. I mean, even I've, the, there was a beautiful turning point with Jordy before they even got on the ship when he says, he's like, Jean-Luc, they have my girls. And and Jean-Luc just says, we're going to take care of it. And you see that same, like there, Jordy has been so suspicious of Jean-Luc for a while and like mad at him for things. And then in his weak moment, he turns to him and he still wants him to, 
be Captain Picard and reassure him that he's going to save the day, which he does. Now, it was convenient for them to have Rafi and Seven have to stay behind because they have no connection to the Enterprise D. I know, but I did feel like it didn't make sense for them to stay behind. Like, to do what? To just get killed. Like Yeah, that- I mean, it couldn't just be to watch Shaw die. Like, maybe they should have been given a job, like sabotage the ship or would it find out, you know, they need a task. And they should have been given a task by Picard to say, you need to do this because we're going to go do this other thing and then we'll meet you back later. Right. But we need someone to do this other bit over here. And I'm, I also have to say like, given that seven is an ex Borg, nobody ever has really asked her for any, (laughs) asked her to weigh in on anything or, so I just feel like she might have some knowledge about some of these things. She's, she's really smart. (laughs) She's, she's someone you would want in your, you know, sessions in the lab or the conference room as you're trying to work all this stuff out even Rafi gets they're like we looked over Rafi's research not here's Rafi with her research like they just I I'm a little frustrated by the way those two get squeezed out as soon as they don't need them anymore (laughs) when you've got Data and Jordy on the ship and Beverly but you know what makes Data and Jordy and Beverly even more fun adding seven I just feel like there are so many moments where it like i want to hear rafi call picard jl and have everybody turn their heads and be like what they didn't even have their only conversation this whole season i think was her saying go yeah (laughs) and i think like uh, yes i want to see our crew together but i also love the idea of i love that first scene with with Riker and Seven, and I think about how much fun it would have been to have these other moments. And Seven used to be a Borg, and they would say, do you know anything about this? Can you access anything about this? Something. Can you uh, tap into the network that all the 25-year-olds are in? Something. All we got from that is essentially the rafi Worf dynamic, where is the only two who really developed any kind of relationship, and they, which was done really well. Yes. Everyone else is kind of the TNGers have, and the Titaners have kind of kept to their own sides, yeah. as it were. That's a missed opportunity to me. Well, they've got one more episode for everyone to get to know each other. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. And look, I wouldn't trade that scene of them all stepping onto the bridge for anything. And they were all jammed, as 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 Frank said, jammed into that turbo <laughs> lift together. <laughs> They were all like, like, that's not very big space. Yeah. No, I've heard the Voyager actors also talk about the fun they would have in the turbo lift before the doors open. There was a a bit of a clown car aspect of them all just kind of (laughs) (laughs) coming out of there all at once. Yeah. Because they've never put that many of them in the turbo lift at once (laughs) on the show. That was kind of a new thing. Yeah. I hope Jordy expanded the turbo lift in his rebuild. I took the turbo lift from another ship. I like that this has been Jordy's secret project. It was weird that no one, like Picard and Riker, didn't know that the Enterprise D saucer was removed from Viridian 3 because of the Prime Directive. You'd think they would have at least known that. Like, they seem to be shocked that the saucer existed and wasn't left back on that, you know, pre war planet where Deanna crashed it. Sure. I mean, on my list of things that I felt were holes, that one didn't bother me. I was like, okay. I gave that a hand wave. <laughs> oh, the, yeah. There's a lot of They're waving, busy with which is things. fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was, it's funny because when I was thinking about the Picard looking at the painting in the first episode and how happy he was to see, you know, he had that look on his face that we love. I was thinking, oh, yeah, he was looking at that painting with Laris. Who's Laris? Do you think we're going to see her again? Do you think (laughs) she's done? I think she's done. I just, there's no way to, I mean, maybe, (laughs) I mean, it's like you could throw her in at the end to bookend things, but it just seems, especially because the way Terry talks about how this, they want to set up the next show. I think they're going to spend the last few minutes with Laris, you know, (laughs) on the Titan with Captain Seven. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why Seven was left behind is that, you know, she's going to go all John McClane on that ship. Oh, I know there's always a story reason. It just, you know, doesn't always seem like the logical thing to do. 
Fair enough. But I'm glad Rafi's with her. And hopefully they get to do something kind of cool. The tough thing is they need to kick ass on that ship, but yet not kill anyone. Right. There was a lot of shooting. And they were saying, shoot on stun. Does that even, I, that would work, I guess? We'll find out. They, they don't have cybernetics. It's all genetic now. It's all organic. Right. Just gives her a big headache. But they get all veiny. Yeah, so they that do. You can tell they're, they're borg eat. They're all gross. I know. It did remind me of the vines in that Prodigy episode. Dreamcatcher? Dream mm-hmm. with the planet? Yeah. The murder planet? Larry? <laughs> I think we're kind of done. You know, we're there's so much goodness and I'm ready for the next episode. I mean, I do have some big questions, though, because I'm thinking, so is this the long game plan of the Borg started way back when? You know, so let, let's look at this whole plan of the Borg to take over everything. So did they plan this when they had Lacutus? Did they later realize there was something they could do? What would they have done if he hadn't had a kid? So, Oh, I, I don't. No, no. I, I think when they Borgified Picard in Best of Both Worlds, they wanted him to speak for the Borg. After Starfleet removed all the pieces, they didn't notice that part of this genetic change, because I think. Jordy said only now. So he's kind of implying we have like better microscopes or whatever now. Yeah, than 35 years ago. We could tell uh, Soong, Alton Soong spotted it, that your Eremotic syndrome was never Eremotic syndrome. It was this Borg stuff. So it wasn't, the Borg didn't plan this. But after Janeway did her thing, the Borg, I, you know, this is my headcanon now, but yeah. The Borg were looking for a new way to assimilate. And I, somehow they figured out like, oh, my God, because we did that thing to Picard and then he had a kid and he passed it on. He said they, they somehow got wind of the fact that the kid, I'm guessing they could sense Jack. Yes. That through, makes- th- through their vibrations or whatever. Yep. yep. And they did this maybe years ago or maybe recently. Who knows? And they're like, oh, this is an opportunity. But it was an accident. They they didn't plan this during Best of Both Worlds. This wasn't plan B. This was just kind of a genetic accident. Right. So this wasn't a long game. This was that they realized they had these pieces and they could put them together and do it. Which means everything that Vatic said to Beverly and her taunting, you know, didn't make any sense because Beverly had no idea that Jack didn't belong to her and all of that. And, you know, Jack did belong belong. to her. He's still her son. I mean, you have to look at it. Beverly has had two very remarkable sons. And really, you should be looking into Beverly to see what is so amazing about her, because she's the only common denominator between these two extraordinary young men. (laughs) Right, because they did mention Wesley again. Yes. So no, I'm fine with, with all of that. It's just that like you need to watch it twice to to figure out what the hell's going on because they were going by it so fast. I know it was a lot of information packed into a very short time. And there was some of those like the thing where they were talking about Frontier Day, they did that tag team thing where everybody says something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. that's, you know, that's Trek tradition. Anyway, I think we've talked this one out. And I think one more left. It's hard to believe there's only one episode of the series left. Yes. This this season has been such a revelation. It's been so much fun. I think we've all, everyone on our team has been enjoying it so much. Even with my nitpicks and my crabby things and this and that, I'm still having so much fun with it. I have so many big, joyful, happy, exuberant moments watching it. And tears, everything. I love it. We're in the landing zone, and they are sticking the landing yeah. so far, which has been always a problem with this show. And I'm very optimistic about the season and series finale, even though I'm sad it's coming. Yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap it up with our bits of the week. Why don't you start? Um, I'm going to start with our friends over at the Seventh Rule podcast and the virtual Trek con. They just did a thing this week. This is Sirach Lofton, who was from Deep Space Nine and Ryan Husk. And they're doing this thing called the Cisco Day. They've decided it'd be fun to have something like Captain Picard Day 
And so they kind of worked out based on the star date of when Cisco stepped on DS9 for the first time, what day of the year that would be, because that was when he was declared the prophet and he became the Cisco. The emissary. And that would be May 22nd. So they're making May 22nd the Cisco day. They're going to do a whole series of events and uh, like all online um, uh, honoring Cisco and Avery Brooks and there's going to be fan involvement. They've put out a video, which we'll link in the show notes. So get ready to celebrate the Cisco day on May 22nd. And get some Deep Space Nine action. I like it. It's a great idea. Well, my bit for the week is a podcast that I've really been enjoying. I was on it, but that's not why I enjoy it. Um, it's called Trek, Mary Kill. And I think I've talked about it briefly before, but the, their current episode, you know, they break down the episode. They have a whole bunch of very fun categories, best Trek trope, worst Trek trope, best scenes, best lines. They t- And the two hosts, Brian and Kristen, they're both, they worked in the industry. They're very smart and funny. I don't always agree with them and I still enjoy them, but they broke down the Strange New Worlds episode, The Elysian Kingdom. They expressed all of what I did like and didn't like about that episode so articulately and perfectly in a way that I haven't been able to which was like the weirdness of the Mabenga daughter thing and how cruel the whole thing actually was that he was doing and how it's kind of deranged and weird. And yet what a Star Trek tradition it is to have everybody like in costumes doing crazy things. Anyway, I'm, we'll put a link to that episode. You should check out all of their episodes, but this is my new favorite. They did a nice job on Sub Rosa, I have to say, a while back too. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I've yet to check out this podcast, but I will. I think you very much like it. So that's it for another All Access Star Trek. We have one more episode to go with season three of Star Trek Picard. So we'll see you next Friday. See ya.